Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the seventh week after Pentecost. Thank you for being with me today. Scriptures we're using are Psalm number 65. Uh, we're going to move into 1 Samuel chapter 12 and we'll continue in Acts chapter 8. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Okay. Psalm number 65. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be performed in Jerusalem. To you that hear prayer shall all flesh come because of their transgressions. Our sins are stronger than we are, but you will blot them out. Happy are they whom you choose and draw to your courts to dwell there. They will be satisfied by the beauty of your house, by the holiness of your temple. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. You make fast the mountains by your power. They are girded about with might. You still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the clamor of the peoples. Those who dwell at the ends of the earth will tremble at your marvelous signs. You make the dawn and the dusk to sing for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing, and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks, and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing. Let us pray. Lord God, joy marks your presence. Beauty, abundance, and peace are the tokens of your work in all creation. Work also in our lives, that by these signs we may see the splendor of your love and may praise you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson is from 1 Samuel chapter 12. We'll read verses 1 through 25. Samuel's farewell address. Samuel said to all of Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray. And behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. 
testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me and I will restore it to you. They said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, the Lord is witness against you. And his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. And Samuel said to the people, the Lord is witness, who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still, that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them, when your fathers, then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hatzor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them, and they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, that we may serve you. The Lord sent Jerubal and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And now behold the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. Behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins, this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, a long one today. Um, Samuel's farewell address. That's kind of foreboding, huh? He's given it up. So he begins by saying, I did what you asked. I obeyed you. You asked for a king, and I gave you one. All right. 
um, he he pulls, he acknowledges in this chapter that he has gone along with the request of the people. And even though he does this, we know it was the Lord who was behind the whole event. Okay. God is the actor in the background. He is working. He is the one who worked to ensure that it was Saul that the people picked. Right. So now he gathers them the same way that Moses did Deuteronomy 29. The same way Joshua did, Joshua 23 and 24. And now he rehearses Israel's history, reminding them of the Lord's care and gracious presence. The terms of the Lord's covenant relationship with Israel remained the same, notwithstanding change in administrative leadership and style. Interesting. Okay. So, behold, the king walks before you. I, the prophet, am old and gray. The prophet's job is different from the king's job, right? Prophet, priest, king, three different jobs, three different roles and responsibilities. <clears throat> I'm old and gray. My sons are with you, okay? He has Abijah and Joel, right? So they are with the people. Samuel's, he served his time, okay? I've walked before you from my youth till this day. Remember, Samuel was himself something of a, a divine conception, right? His mother couldn't have children. She begged God for a child. God gave her Samuel. And as soon as he was old enough, as he was weaned, um, as a very young child, he was brought to the temple, given to Eli, right? We read all that. That was early in this book. And this is what he said when God spoke to him. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Now, he says the same to the people. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. That's the king. Okay? Kings are anointed. Testify against me. So he's showing that regardless of his son's misuse of power. Okay? Chapter 8, verse 3, it says. Let's take a quick look there. Chapter 8, verse 3. Mm. The name of Samuel's firstborn son was Joel. The name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in Samuel's ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So they're just as evil as the rest of Israel, which really makes this sentence have double meaning right my sons are with you right they are doing the same wicked things that the country that the nation did i have walked before you the whole country the whole nation israel from my youth till this day here i am testify against me before his anointed the king now have i done anything wicked to any of you have i taken a work animal an ox or a donkey have I defrauded you? Have I oppressed you? Have I taken a bribe? Have I done anything that I could have done in my position as prophet? Okay. <clears throat> he received no personal, despite his sons doing it, he received no personal gain from his service as judge over Israel. In contrast to the king who will take. The anointed refers to Saul, but we also can't rule out that there might be a reference to Christ here, or at least an inference. So then he says, let's see. Well, they said, you've not. You've not defrauded us. You've not oppressed us. You've not taken anything from anyone's hand. He served in a godly way, in a God-pleasing way. Samuel was a righteous man. And they testified to that. He said to them, the Lord is witness against you, his anointed, the king is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said he is witness, he, both God and king. This is um, poetic. There's repetition and comparison between the Lord and his anointed. And both of them served as witness for Samuel. Samuel accuses the people before the real judge, the Lord. He did this in Judges chapter 11. 
They had fallen away from the Lord's ways, but the Lord had remained faithful to them. Isn't that always how it goes? People fall away from God. God didn't move. God didn't move. They did. Uh, so then the next several verses. He, he gives a creed-like historical account of the Lord's continuing care. Recalls the cycle of sin and servitude, supplication, the people turn to God and ask, salvation, and then silence. The basic sin was that Israel forgot the Lord, but he never forgot them. And that's from verse 8 all the way down to 15, right? That's what he talks about here. Baals and Ashtaroth, these are the false idols, right? This is the male and this is the female, basically. Different kinds of pagan god, a pagan god, a pagan goddess. But deliver us out of our hand out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you, right? And God did. And then this is the one we've been reading about in the last couple of chapters, Nahash, the king of the Ammonites. Give us a king. Give us give us our own king. They didn't want to serve this king. They wanted their own king. So, behold the kingdom you've chosen, the one you have asked for. The Lord has set a king over you. He gave you one. But where was it? Uh, no, there was one. The Lord God was your king. You already had a king. You already had a king. They they just didn't understand that God never wanted, God never wanted a human king for them. He wanted to be their king. But he gave them one. He gave them Saul. So if the Lord has set one over you, Saul, and if you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, serve other gods. If both you and Saul will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. If you can do this, it will be well. So God's letting them try out this authority, letting them have a mortal king. It'll be well if you can do that. But if you don't obey the voice of the Lord, if you rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Okay. Hmm. So. God will not defend you. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Um, okay. So he lists some judges in verse 11, right? Um, Jerubbabel, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel. Not chronological. Not sure why they did it in this order, but it reflects their prominence which culminated in Samuel. He was the most prominent of those judges. Jerubbabel was Gideon's nickname, emphasizing his rejection of the Canaanite Baal worship. Samuel refers to himself objectively here, using a recognized legal technique to convict the people of their sin. So this would have been, we don't really talk like this, but this is how they would have understood what he was saying there. Samuel repeats the traditional covenant relationship that God had established with his people, beginning with Abraham, continuing through Moses, Joshua, and now Samuel himself. That's verse 14, right? If you will fear the Lord and serve him, right? This is how it's supposed to work. This is how God wants it to work. <clears throat> These are the same alternatives Moses and Joshua presented to the people, and Samuel presents it to them, either the Lord or not. The first commandment is always at the heart of Israel's history. You shall have no other gods. It's always at the heart of their history. It's almost always when they screw up. Okay. So, <laughs> obey his voice. The word there actually means hear, but the implication is the one who is hearing it will obey him. So, oh, geez, my, sorry. So, so um, when he says, isn't the wheat harvest today, he's, he's going to give them a sign. 
see this great thing. It's not the wheat harvest today. It means it's late spring and rain is terribly rare in that time of the year. They would never have expected rain. So you're going to see this. You're going to get both thunder and rain and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great. Right. In asking for yourselves a king, which you did in the sight of the Lord. Okay. This is my testimony. I'm telling you it's a bad thing. And God believes it's a, God says it's a bad thing. And here's proof. Thunder and rain at a time of the year when you should never have thunder and rain. And Samuel called on the Lord. The Lord sent thunder and rain. And struck fear into the people. Oh, Samuel means business. He really is on God's side. Um, Samuel's predicted an unusual thunder and rain confirms his judgment of the people. Disaster will harm the wheat harvest by creating conditions for mold. Could destroy the whole crop. Such an unusual experience in May or June brings fear upon the people. Reminds them of the exodus when the Lord displayed his power. Samuel also demonstrates his own prophetic power, illustrating his ability to communicate with God. He's a prophet and a judge. So, now, 19, 20, 21, people said, pray for your servants. This is very similar to Exodus 9, verse 28. Very similar request of Moses. Um, ask God to spare us. Samuel says, don't be afraid. Yes, you have done evil, but don't turn aside from following the Lord. Okay. Now, do you hear the grace there? Even though they sinned, they can still follow the Lord and they can turn back. They can repent. If they can do that, they don't need to be afraid. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver because they are empty. Normally, he's talking about idols here actual wooden bronze and stone idols idols of false gods but many things can be idols and we should take that to heart too samuel points out the graciousness of god's continuing presence among them he after advising them not to follow other empty ways he affirms reaffirms that the lord's hand and instruction will continue to guide the people as he had under moses now um samuel's role as judge is going to stop Far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way, but I'm not going to be judged anymore. He will continue to be the voice of God as a prophet, interceding for them and instructing them in the, in the ways of the Lord. Right? Just fear the Lord. Know that you know, this is that healthy on respect. Right? Fear him, serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he's done for you. Right? And be thankful for that. If you still do wickedly, you should be swept away, both you and your king. There will be punishment for it. So don't do that. All right. We'll pick up there with chapter 13 tomorrow. All right. Acts chapter 8. I'll read verses 14 to 25. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord, that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. All right. So uh, yesterday we had Simon the Magician, right? And he thought he was pretty hot stuff. <laughs> he was able to do magic, which, as we said yesterday, is forbidden by Old Testament law. But when he heard Philip preach the gospel, talk about Jesus Christ, Simon believed. His heart was turned. He got himself baptized. Now, but now apparently that baptism wasn't, it wasn't a Trinitarian baptism, right? It wasn't in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but only in the name of the Son. Okay, so it wasn't complete. Now, what was God doing here? God had something that needed to be taught. Now, was Philip wrong? Doesn't really say that outright, but it does kind of hint at that, doesn't it? All right, so these first three verses, or four, 14, 15, 16, 17, the outward gift of the Spirit through the apostles' prayers and the laying on of hands served to unify the church, binding together Jews and Samaritans who practiced different but related religions. The two elements of baptism are water and the word. Notice that Peter and John did not re-baptize those who had been baptized. Right? They didn't put them back in the water. They didn't sprinkle them. They laid their hands on them. The one baptism conveyed the gifts of faith in Christ and eternal salvation, which are worked by the Spirit through the water and the Word. Okay, so. So, the, the apostles, the twelve, heard that Samaria received had received the Word of God. Now, remember, there was some persecution right? Stephen had been stoned. That's what we read on Monday. Stephen had been stoned and was killed. There became a, there was like a, a, a resurgence of prosecution, persecution of these early Christians, right? Um, and Saul, later to be, later be known as Paul, um, the Pharisee was taking part and going door to door and finding Christians and having them arrested, right? He was persecuting the church. <clears throat> so some of them scattered, and that's how Philip came to Samaria, right? So when the when the twelve heard, they sent Peter and John, right? The the rock on whom Christ was to build the church, and John, the apostle that Jesus loved, all right? They came down. Samaria is a lower elevation from Jerusalem. Came down and prayed for the people of Samaria that they might receive the Holy Spirit for he had not fallen on any of them. Um, so the baptism, let's just say it wasn't wrong, but it wasn't complete, right? The action hadn't been completed because they didn't receive the Holy Spirit yet. So they had their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay. So when Simon saw that, he offered them money. Give me this too. He didn't understand godly power. He didn't understand the gift of the Holy Spirit. If it's a gift, you don't have to pay for it, right? So on Pentecost, in Acts chapters 1 and 2, a public demonstration of the Spirit's approval was given. Luke, who wrote Acts, records that this public demonstration appears as new groups were received into the one church through the ministry of the apostles. Samaritans in chapter 8, Gentiles in chapter 10, Disciples of John the Baptist in chapter 19. In each case, these groups knew God's word and the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. The preaching and the gift of the Spirit confirmed to them that Jesus is indeed that Messiah. So, um, yeah, so Simon is captivated by the power. Right, he was a magician. I guess that that shouldn't surprise us. He he was able to work magic before this, so he's probably addicted to power in some way. He he likes because he knows he could always capture the attention of the people by having power. Now he sees more power. He's trying to think of it in the terms that he used to see his own his old magic power from. Um, 
which is a very misplaced way to put your attention. Um, you don't ask for the Holy Spirit so you can have power. You ask for the Holy Spirit so that you can be in relationship with God. He didn't really have that understanding yet. He believed the gospel that Jesus is the Messiah foretold, that he died and was raised to save us from our sins, right? So um, he sought to purchase apostolic authority and continue his influence among the Samaritans. He had influence. He wanted to keep that. The walk of faith begins in humility. Submitting yourself to God's authority, wanting to retain influence. That's not humble. So Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Nope. Peter pronounced a curse on Simon to emphasize rejection of his offer. God commanded his people to provide for servants of the word. However, the gospel and the blessings thereof cannot be bought or sold. Peter couldn't sell it either. God's blessings and authority are gifts of God. The early church fathers attribute the beginning of heresies to Simon, though this is likely a simplification of the history. Simon became known as the arch heretic, and the attempt to buy authority in the church was named Simony. <laughs> How would you like to have that legacy? Jeez. So without hesitation, Peter condemned this lust for power and warned Simon that he had sinned. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, receiving the Holy Spirit, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this sin, this wickedness of yours. Pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Sin begins in the heart, right? Where I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. The bitter fluid secreted by the liver. Ooh, geez. The gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Uh, Simon is enslaved to sin, and this is how Peter is describing it. It's bitter. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you said may come upon me. Hmm, sounds like what the people said to their judge, Samuel, huh? Very similar prayer. Not a coincidence. Now, unlike Ananias and Sapphira that we read about in chapter 5, Simon immediately asked Peter to intercede on his behalf and to remove the curse. So the... Yeah, it doesn't say it, but it doesn't say whether Peter did it or not, does it? So the apostles expanded Philip's work of preaching and teaching. They picked up where he left off. They testified, and they, when they had testified and spoken the word of God, that the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, and on the way they preached the gospel to the villages, many villages of the Samaritans, all along their path. The church continued to grow. That's a good thing. All right, let's conclude. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, Lord, that the course of this world may be so governed by your direction, that your church may rejoice in serving you in godly peace and quietness. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, looking good to continue our uh, normal schedule this week. Normal, such as it is. So we'll keep trudging along. Hope you can uh, be with me for each of that. And If you can't, try and keep up with the readings, because these readings have a good flow to them. They do a good job of telling the story of God's people and how... He continues to give them and us grace, even when we don't deserve it. And that is definitely good news. So again, thank you for being here. I wish you a blessed rest of your Wednesday. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.